Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, another little bit of um, sports medicine gold here on uh, Bartold Biomechanics. Hope you're all enjoying the website. As always, if there's anything at all you need, let me know. So I had an inquiry over the weekend um, about a condition that we're going to discuss this morning. Really important one, uh, something I see all the time, um, something we've seen a little bit of a rash of with uh, the trend towards minimalist footwear, and that is stress fractures of the metatarsals. Now, pretty common condition. We see stress fractures in metatarsals two, three, four, quite commonly. They are the second most common stress fracture um, uh, apart from tibial stress fracture, and so they represent quite a, uh, a significant issue in sports medicine. By far the most important stress fracture um, of the foot is of the second metatarsal head. Very, very common in runners. The repetitive load of running creates a problem, and that's what we're going to discuss this morning. Now, there are a number of reasons why uh, we do see um, stress fractures in the second metatarsal, and I'm going to um, jump up and bring this... Uh, this skeleton a bit closer to the camera so we can discuss it, but there are three main reasons why we see that. So the first reason is, as you can see, the second metatarsal is substantially longer than any of the other metatarsals. Um, and so that really means that there is an issue with the bending moment through this particular bone. The other reason that the second metatarsal is particularly susceptible to stress fracture is because if you have a, uh, a foot that's pronating, then obviously we're going to get some dorsiflexion uh, as ground reaction force pushes down, we're going to get dorsiflexion of the first ray, and that's going to uh, increase the load going through the second metatarsal. And again, we're going to see some change in the bending moments through that bone. Finally, you can see that there's a very interesting and unusual anatomical arrangement at the base of the second metatarsal. Um, so you can see that it's essentially locked in between the lateral and medial cuneiforms. Um, and this means that it's a little bit more rigid um, than some of the other metatarsals. And so it's a bit stiffer, if you like, and therefore restrained and does not have the same ability to uh, resist load that perhaps the other metatarsals uh, have. Okay, so <clears throat> that's... Uh, that's a, a, a bit of a nutshell of the, um, of the anatomy of the situation and some of the reasons why we do see it more commonly in this particular bone. There are a couple of other things that you need to be wary of. Um, the, the fracture site will normally occur um, mid-shaft. That's the most common area for us to see it. And normally when you're palpating along the bone, you might see some, uh, some swelling, you might see some erythema, normal sort of things that you'll see with a stress fracture. The history is terribly important because stress fractures occur along a, con a clinical continuum. So we have, uh, we have bone stress followed by stress reaction followed by stress fracture. That's the continuum of bony injury. We also tend to see pain occurring along that continuum. So it starts slowly and then kind of builds up a full head of steam um, to the point where when we have uh, a, a, a stress fracture, it's pretty painful all the time, but it does appear over a period of time. So if you've got somebody, in particular a runner, who presents, they say, okay, well, it wasn't too bad, but it's getting worse and worse. And in particular, if it's starting to um, be painful at rest or, or in the evenings, then uh, a metatarsal stress factor is, is really high up on your list of um, potential diagnoses. Also be aware that rapid changes in training, rapid changes in footwear, for example, going from a traditional shoe to a more minimalist shoe, is a real red flag in this condition. Um, uh, if people haven't adapted properly, or as we say, the transition to this particular uh, change in footwear, uh, you are going to change the load through the bone and you may end up uh, at the end of that, that continuum with a stress fracture. Um, in terms of imaging, as with all stress fractures, plain x-rays are a bit of, a, a bit of an each way bet. Um, they usually don't show uh, stress fractures very well, so they're not, they're not very specific at all. Um, you might see um, in, a, in a stress fracture that's been hanging around for a few weeks, you might see some changes in periosteal reaction. So as you track down the bone and you're looking at the plant x-ray, you might see some, some changes. A little bit of periosteal lifting might be evident. You might see a little bit of bone sclerosis, which is the first sign that there's bone callus forming. They're things that you might see. 
I'm increasingly using uh, diagnostic ultrasound to diagnose uh, tibial, uh, to diagnose stress fractures. Uh, I used it with a fibula stress fracture only last week with great effect that it showed it perfectly. Um, low cost, non-invasive, uh, does actually show stress fractures very well. It shows the periosteal lifting very well and if you get the right radiologist uh, they, they can pick that up quite nicely. If you want to go to the, uh, the nth degree, uh, uh, MRI of course almost 100% spe specific and almost 100% um, sensitive so it will image it absolutely beautifully but it's an expensive investigation. Honestly the diagnosis is clinical if you've got somebody who's um, had a change in training, a change in footwear, presents with gradual onset pain on the met shaft, you've got a, probably a metatarsal stress fracture. Now a couple of other things to watch out for, there are a couple of unusual variants of this injury. Um, you might want to be looking for uh, the very specific fracture that occurs at the base of the second metatarsal. Now this is one not to be missed because this is a little bit like a, a, a navicular stress fracture. They tend towards non-union, so you have to pick it up as early as you possibly can. Be aware that this is particularly a problem for dancers, especially if they're on point a lot. They get a lot of compression loading, so they get a lot of uh, loading coming down through the base, and uh, they can get a fracture in this area. Uh, that's probably where you would need to be looking at MRI to make the, uh, the diagnosis uh, as accurately as you possibly can. It's often quite difficult because it can present as a, a capsulitis or a synovitis of the tarsometatarsal joint, so you need to rule that out. At the other end of the, uh, the spectrum, down this end, uh, we've got uh, Freiburg's infraction, uh, which is a, uh, uh, an aseptic um, um, necrosis of uh, cancellous bone. And I guess you're all pretty familiar with that. It's, um, very common in adolescence, so particularly around the age of 14, and it presents as a hot, painful joint, um, and you will on x-ray see flattening of the, uh, the metatarsal head, the second metatarsal head, so it has a very characteristic square appearance. So that's Freiburg's infraction, uh, sometimes called Freiburg's osteonecrosis. Uh, so they're the two main ones to look out for. Also be aware that there are systemic disorders that can mimic this at either end of the, uh, of the actual metatarsal. Things like uh, Reiter's syndrome, uh, uh, psoriatic arthritis, even gout. So keep those in the back of your mind. But they're not going to present as mid-shaft metatarsal pain. Okay, so that's normally pretty, uh, pretty easy to diagnose. All right, that's a snapshot of second metatarsal stress fracture, a very common injury in sports medicine. The treatment, of course, is what you all want to know about. Look, the treatment is rest with modified activity. Um, when you've got bone injury, when you've got a, a stress fracture, there's no way out of that. Um, athletes hate the four-letter word rest, so always say modified rest. Um, it's a four to, week, four to six week exercise. I always get my athletes cross-training doing something different, so running in the deep end of a pool. Um, it may be that they can get on an ergo or even on a bike. Um, my guideline is if it doesn't hurt, it's okay. Um, but you've got to make sure they're being honest with you because some athletes will say it's not hurting when actually it is stirring it up. Um, I say to them, listen, you've got a choice here. If you don't, um, if you don't adhere to the treatment program we've uh, laid out for you, you may go to the ultimate extreme of the, uh, the, the clinical continuum, and that is a complete cortical fracture, and your four to six week injury then becomes an eight to 12 week injury. So that's a choice you have to make that normally will settle them down, so that might be a trick you want to have up your sleeve. But modified rest, they have to, uh, they have to uh, uh, stop the activity that created the problem. That often will be running, so they have to ease back on their running program, and you have to look at other modifications that uh, will help to maintain their uh, aerobic capacity. And also a little bit of light loading of the bone, um, we think is probably a good thing as well, so that's where something like cycling might, might be quite useful. Alrighty, that's it. Second metatarsal stress fracture. I hope that's given you a few little pearls there and I'll speak to you very soon with another condition. Bye for now.